got one of the most ambitious climate strategies anywhere in the world. In summer 2016, I set off for Addis Ababa to research about how practical their twin objectives of economic growth and climate neutrality are. And today, I'm presenting my findings to Oxfam. This is a really extraordinarily important and topical issue. Unfortunately, we have some very cutting edge and interesting research on this via Stephen here. And Stephen had a career, a long career, a successful career in the British housing industry, and then decided to take um, a very different change of direction and went to Birmingham University to study international development. Yeah, that's right. And was particularly interested in this topic and went out to Ethiopia to research it and was given quite a lot of help by um, Oxfam, both here uh, and in Ethiopia. I'm going to be presenting for about 20 minutes, setting out the massive, massive environmental challenge facing the government of Ethiopia and then evaluating their chances of meeting that challenge. Leapfrogging. Myth or reality? Can economic development really be decoupled, uncoupled, from increased carbon emissions in least developed countries, in LDCs? This is um, Ethiopia's story. Can we leapfrog, can we bypass polluting development and transition straight to green development from a very low level of development? Ethiopia's story, this is a lesser known part of Ethiopia's story. And just very briefly and quite simply at the beginning, I'm just going to ask you for a little bit of input. What are the main headlines which you hear coming out of Ethiopia in the news now? What are the main headlines? Just anybody? Drought. Drought. Um, yes, um, there is uh, 7 million people currently in food, in situations of food scarcity in Ethiopia. Anything else? Civil unrest. Civil unrest. Um, Ethiopia is governed by the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Front, who have 100% of the representation in Parliament, and there has been significant recent political unrest, including fatalities, deaths, um, in the Oromia province to the south and the Amara province to the north. Any other um, contributions? Yes. Uh, the refugee crisis, particularly in the west of the country, from South Sudan. Refugee crisis. So on top of an expanding population <coughs> in Ethiopia, you have refugees coming in as well. And we'll come to that uh, in, in a bit. Sorry, and there was one more over here. What's that? No, okay. Um, those are the headlines which are coming out of Ethiopia at the moment. But there are other themes too. You may not be aware that in 2011, the Ethiopian government committed to its, what they call its, their CRGE, their Climate Resilient Green Economy, CRGE. It, that is its strategy for green growth. And the reason we're talking about this now is this is arguably the most ambitious strategy for green growth anywhere in the world. And you will see what I mean. This is Mela Zanawi, who was Prime Minister from 95 to 2012. This is what he said in 2010. 
We plan to sustain our current double-digit rates of economic growth for the next 15 years so that by 2025, we, Ethiopia, becomes a middle-income country. To put figures on this, that means that by 2025, Ethiopia needs to grow its economy 3.3 times between 2010 and 2025. Let's just put that in a UK context for a moment. Growing your economy 3.3 times. Okay. He also said, we plan to do this in a manner that would allow us to have zero net carbon emissions by 2030. <clears throat> Massive economic boom with nil additional greenhouse gases. Just want to say that this here would be GNI, gross national income, and this is real incomes. So forget about inflation, this is real incomes for the country. Currently, one third of the population of Ethiopia live on less than $1.25 a day. One third. The aspiration to be a middle income country in nine years time. If that were not enough, those two things together, we've got a population thing going on here as well. The context is that these two commitments are set within a rapidly rising population. So, by 2030, there will be an additional 58% citizens of Ethiopia. Each additional person requiring a minimum standard of living and generating a need for CO2, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So, we have affluence and environmental impact, the different factors, affluence, income, environmental impact, within the context of a rapidly expanding population. Impact, population, affluence. So this is the scale of the mountain which the government of Ethiopia has set itself to climb. Frankly, when I went out to Ethiopia this summer, I, I, I was trying to work out whether this was serious, whether they meant what they were saying. Now, this is to do with Ethiopia. Does this have wider significance? Some of you will be familiar with Ethiopia, but you'll all have interests in different parts of the developing world. Is there a wider significance? Does it, does it matter on a world scale? Experts have discussed for decades whether growth, economic growth, can really be decoupled from negative environmental impact, greenhouse gases, in this instance. <coughs> you have relative decoupling, where emissions rise less fast than growth, but still rise or you get absolute decoupling, where emissions can go down even when growth is increasing. The ideal is clearly the absolute decoupling. <coughs> to put it simply, is it possible for development to be sustainable? Established theories, such as this one here, 
which has proponents and also has critics, state that environmental damage inevitably rises with income. Environmental damage rising, income rising. The two, it says, are inextricably linked. There's an invisible hand at work. Incomes rise, damage rises. The theory goes that this continues until a point of prosperity is reached and then enhanced technology means that per person damage goes down. That's the theory. Of course. If this is true, then every LDC, least developed country, has an unenviable choice. Either to pursue economic growth or to pursue climate and environmental responsibility. This diagram would say you can't have both. Whether you're in <coughs> Dodoma or Dakar, Port-au-Prince or Addis Ababa, Kigali, wherever, leaders of developing countries, if this is true, have a stark choice. But what if Ethiopia does manage to achieve the impossible, growth decoupled from greenhouse gas increases. What if it can leapfrog dirty technologies and go straight to green solutions? If Ethiopia is able to do this, the twin goals of economic transformation and carbon neutrality, then it acts as a beacon to other LDCs. So this is what is at stake when we look at Ethiopia's story. So can we, can we quantify the scale of the challenge here for Ethiopia. This looks technical, but just work, just, just work with it because the, the concepts are quite simple here. Impact, environmental damage, greenhouse gas emissions, is a factor, a product of three simple factors. Population times affluence times a technology or leapfrogging factor. So our question is, can gains in technological efficiency offset the negative environmental effects of more people, population, living at a greater wealth, affluence, while not damaging the environment, while having a nil impact? Can it happen? So, the research, what we did, very simple, what we did is we populated this equation. Firstly, let's look at the impact. Ethiopia is saying that there will be nil adverse impact. 2030, there will be no more greenhouse gases than there was in 2010. No change. Population. Ethiopia says that, uh, sorry, the World Bank, uh, all, of this, uh, all of this data is from the World Bank, I should have said that. Um, the World Bank forecasts a 58% increase in the number of people by 2030, so up by 58%. Affluence, again, we know the answer to this because the government of Ethiopia has committed to middle income status and simple trend analysis shows us that this will mean that incomes, uh, gross national income, needs to rise by a factor of 3.3. So we know what the aim is there. Can technological efficiency, carbon efficiency, offset the effect 
of more people living to a higher standard of living, making sure that the environment is undamaged. Technology, carbon efficiency, is the key. Working this through, working the numbers through, we worked out uh, it's clear that Ethiopia's um, carbon efficiency needs to increase by a factor of 5.6 times over those 20 years, 2010 to 2030. It needs to be more carbon efficient. Now, just a note for geeks on this, of which I include myself on that. Um, the T, the te technology here, can be seen as being either a cost associated with each unit of pollution, so gram of greenhouse gas emission per dollar, or it can be seen in a broader sense of everything in Ethiopian society that is not emissions and population and income. So the whole of society, is that able to adapt to ensure that this is achieved as the government has committed itself to? Now, so, so what? 5.6, we, what's that figure mean? Um, so, how do we know that this is a tough ask? for Ethiopia? Well, using the same data source, the World Bank, we then went back and compared it to six other countries. How had their carbon efficiency increased and improved over times of strong economic growth for them? Remember, Ethiopia needs to achieve a factor, a carbon efficiency improvement of 5.6 times. So over the 14 years between 1999 and 2012, the UK and the US only improved their carbon efficiencies by 1.97 and 1.88. So not in the same league as Ethiopia has committed to do. Even BRICS countries, Brazil and China, only achieved carbon efficiencies, technological efficiencies, of 1.8 and 3.04 uh, times. That's what the technolog technological gains were for those countries. Once again, nowhere near what Ethiopia needs to achieve. The closest was Ghana, who pulled off efficiency improvements of 4.78. That's just numbers. What the point I'm trying to make here is that this demonstrates that this is a tough, tough ask, which the government of Ethiopia has set itself. By any reckoning, it's tough. So, all of that was the preamble, I'm afraid. The big question, can Ethiopia achieve these twin aims set out in their CRGE, Climate Resilient Green Economy? I really hoped they could. But as I flew into Addis Ababa, I was full of doubt and questions and scepticism. This is impossible, isn't it? So I started the research there, and I started by interviewing government officials and uh, advisors, academics and people from civil society. And I discovered that universally there was a real earnestness 
in seeking these targets. Everybody, from whatever sector I interviewed them from, appeared wholly on message on here and signed up to the goals. So, I then went back to the World Bank data. In the 14 years between 1999 and 2012, incomes, what happened to incomes in Ethiopia? Incomes rose by a factor, the GNI, incomes rose by a factor of 3.4 times. Massive growth in GNI. Population, so incomes rose, sorry, uh, incomes rose. Population, well, population rose too. Population rose with an extra 43% again of mouths to feed over those 14 years. So, what happened to greenhouse gases? World Bank stats. Overall greenhouse gas emissions over this period declined by 15%. At Ethiopia's early stage of development, greenhouse gas emissions had, and growth, had indeed become decoupled. Technology had increased over those 14 years. The efficiency, carbon efficiency, had increased 5.7 times. So the track record was in place to justify the lofty ambitions of the CRGE and continuing on the same trajectory would enable this, uh, these objectives to be met. Now, I must say, from my point of view, this was not the result I was expecting when I went to Ethiopia. Um, I was uh, very surprised to come up with this. Um, and so I'm, at the moment, I'm looking and trying to weigh up what the significance is of this. Enough of the numbers. Um, what's Ethiopia been doing to meet this enormous challenge? This is the practical side of it. Uh, my study focused on finance to a large degree, how Ethiopia was going to get the 150 billion US dollars it needed, estimated, 7.5 billion a year, to make this transformation happen. But I'm not going to focus on the money. Uh, I'm going to go sp specifically and look at three snapshots. I'm going to zoom right in from the... Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, the first one, if we can just... Okay, first snapshot. The Addis Ababa light rail transit. Um, Addis Ababa's got a new landmark. Uh, opened ahead of schedule, September 2015. 34 kilometres, 39 stops, carrying 15,000 people an hour. As 98% of Ethiopia's electricity is renewable, this is really a green growth project. Interestingly, the carriages carry two logos. The Ethiopian Railway Corporation and the state-owned China Railway Group, CREC, because 85% of the money was loaned from the Exim Bank of Japan. 
Second snapshot, December 2013, the government of Ethiopia was accredited to receive up to 50 million US dollars per project through the Green Climate Fund. They are currently trying to stretch that so that they can get pull in more resources and have bigger impacts. And they've put in a new bid for, to the Green Climate Fund for 90 million US dollars, um, match funded by an extra 74 million from the government of Ethiopia. This is what it's for. This is what they want it to be for. In the past, individual initiatives addressed drought-affected communities by targeting single issues, often interventions. It could be agricultural practices, or it could be irrigation requirements, or water supply, or forest preservation, whatever. This bid to the, GC, to the GCF is for a multi-layer intervention. This gives affected communities a tailored options, a menu, for a range of interventions. And at the moment, they are still awaiting GCF um, uh, authority to proceed on that. And the final snapshot. Shoshimini, geothermal. Some of the figures here are amazing. Ethiopia's Growth and Transformation Plan aims to raise the country's electrical generation capacity between 2015 and 2020, five years, by over four times, producing over four times as much electricity uh, in 2020 as, as in 2015. To achieve this, they need to build 10 or 12 new power generating plants. Clean geothermal has become a real priority here in Shashashami, in the Aromia region, along the Great Rift Valley, is a good location for this, as you can see. One problem, they need to have two billion US dollars to make this happen. Now, October 2013, a US Icelandic consortium signed a memorandum of understanding with the Ethiopian government allowing that money to come in. And President Obama signed off on that when he was in Ethiopia July 2015. But it was at that point or soon after that point that major difficulties occurred in the as they were hammering out the a small print. The proposed investment was unravelling on issues of royalty payments or treatment of VAT or profit repatriation, becoming critical. What did the government of Ethiopia do? Well, summer before last, they called back all of their deputies in the middle of their summer recess from all over Ethiopia to Addis Ababa to debate and pass the Geothermal Resource Development Proclamation, which safeguarded this investment. And that has provided, that critical intervention, has provided a model or a template for massive foreign investment in the power sector. So, wrapping up. Um, conclusions. Where's this got us? World Bank data suggests that Ethiopia has indeed achieved decoupling of greenhouse gas emissions from growth, 1999 to 2012, which, when I went there, was not what I was expecting to find. Continuation on this trajectory suggests that the twin aims of the CRGE are achievable. Clearly, 
a lot more work and research needs to be done on this. Methodologies can be improved uh, in terms of the research um, on, on IPAT, the IPAT, and there's quite a lot of other extra um, additional um, work which could be done. Will Ethiopia find it harder to decouple once the early wins have been banked? Is it even possible for developing countries to continue leapfrogging at the same rate after the low-hanging fruit has been taken? Or is it just possible that Ethiopia has forged a new route for sustainable and climate-compatible development, a model for other LDCs to follow? More work is needed on this so that we can answer some of these questions. Um, I am indebted to Oxfam, to um, Catherine and to John, uh, also to Ethiopia's Environment and Climate Research Centre in Addis Ababa, to the University of Birmingham and also to the UNDP in Ethiopia who've been following this. I would be delighted to a follow up on any of these issues with you and my contact details will be available. Um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I think Steve did a really interesting talk because I, it's extremely significant whether countries like Ethiopia and other less developed countries can leapfrog to economic development at the same time as not producing more greenhouse gas emissions. This is a massive issue for all LDCs. And to have one country that seems to have achieved this, at least in the early stages of development, is very significant. I don't think anybody's shown this before. They haven't used the same calculations that Steve used. That's quite innovative. And if he's right, then it really is a shining example for other LDCs. And I think it is really quite a significant piece of research.